Hi again, and welcome back. So previous videos have discussed parametric statistical tests, such as the t-test or ANOVA, which require that your data are normally distributed. So in those cases, you can and you should use graphical methods, such as a histogram, to assess the assumptions for those tests. But what if your question specifically involves testing whether data follow a normal distribution itself? Well, if that's the case, the Shapiro-Wilk test is designed for that purpose. So first, a quick sort of description or detour into these things called QQ plots, because it turns out they're actually related to the Shapiro-Wilk test. So these plots are also quite useful for assessing normality. Um, they have the actual data on the y-axis with the values put in order from the smallest one to the largest one. The x-axis shows the quantiles for something called the expected normal order statistics. Basically, what are the expected points you would have from a normal distribution with the same sample size, but with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of, of one? So if the data are actually normally distributed, the points should fall along a straight line because they're both normal distributions. Um, this is especially true in the middle of the distribution um, between so the first and the third quartiles. Um, the edges, you can get a little bit fuzzier, noisier. So it turns out, as we'll see, the slope of this line is actually the standard deviation of your data, um, which will become important later on. If you have non-normal data, if it's skewed or otherwise not normal, it will plot as some kind of curvy line that deviates um, from this expected line, you know, maybe over large parts of it or at the edges or something like that. So you can actually use the shape of the QQ plot to identify the way or the ways in which your data differ from a normal distribution. In the case of skewed distributions, you probably don't gain much by doing this. It's probably kind of obvious from the histogram that it's skewed, um, but QQ plots are, are very useful for identifying what are called thin-tailed distributions, where there's fewer data points than you'd expect at the edges and more than you'd expect at the center, or fat-tailed or thick-tailed distributions where there's more data than you'd expect at the extreme values and less at the center than you'd expect. So when reading the QQ plots, if you look at the left-hand edge of the line, points that are below the line there indicate more observations than you'd expect if it was normal. And points above the line indicate fewer observations than you'd expect if it was normal. Now, on the right-hand side of the plot, the opposite's true. Points above the line indicate more observations than you'd expect, and points below the line indicate fewer observations than you'd expect. And you can compare each of these histograms to the corresponding Q, 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 Q plot to see how, this, how, they, how they match up. Right, but what if you specifically want to test whether your data differ significantly from a normal distribution? Well, the Shapiro-Wilk test is a formal way of doing that. It has the null hypothesis that your sample comes from a normally distributed population. Now, because the normal distribution is a continuous probability distribution, you can only use this test on a univariate continuous data. So one variable and has to co compare one sample to an expectation of a normal distribution. So the test statistic calculates this thing called W, and it uses this formula here. So the denominator of this formula might be a little bit familiar to you from previous videos, because it's this thing called the sum of squares. Right? Each point, subtract the mean, square it, add them all up. And this is basically the same thing as variance. But where does this numerator come from? It's kind of weird looking. And what is this A value anyways? Well, this is where we come back to QQ plots. So on a QQ plot, the expected normal order values that are on the x-axis represent a normal distribution with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. But on the y-axis, the observed ordered values of your data are in whatever units they're in, right? They're in the original data units and they have the mean of your data and the standard deviation of your data as well, right? So that means that if the data if your data follow a normal distribution, the line will have a slope equal to the standard deviation of your data and an intercept equal to the mean of your data. Because right? the mean of the standard of the normal order is zero and your mean will be whatever it is. And the standard, and the standard deviation is just the, the slope basically, right? So this is actually very useful. Now there are some complexities 
and we can't use sort of a standard method of fitting the loss, which we haven't covered in this class yet. We'll get to it later on. But basically, we can't use sort of a standard line fitting method because we've rearranged the data. We put your we put our, our data in order from smallest to largest. And and by doing so, that means that there's greater scatter of the data around our best fit line at the edges and less in the middle. And that violates a key assumption of sort of the normal what's called linear regression approach. But there is a method to deal with this. We can use this thing called generalized least squares regression, which accounts for the structure of the points around the line. It can account for the fact that there's more scatter around the line at the edges than there is in the middle. So let's get back to the equation here. Right, and especially the, especially this numerator part, with the, which is the sum of these a values multiplied by each data point and then squaring the whole thing. So basically, this numerator part, the sum of these a values times the data, is how Shapiro and Wilk estimated the slope of the QQ plot. And remember, the slope is the standard deviation. So the a values are basically constants that kind of fold in a whole bunch of things. They incorporate these normal order statistics. Um, they incorporate the structure of the data around the best fit line, the scatter of the data, this thing called the variance covariance matrix. They normalize for the sample size. They normalize for the scale of the data, whether you're measured on a scale of zero to five or zero to a million, you know, that sort of thing. Right, so basically this thing on the top the sum of a times i is an estimate of the slope of a QQ plot. And that's so Shapiro and Wilk sort of demonstrate that mathematically. Right? And remember, the slope is equal to the standard deviation if the data are normally distributed. Right? So that's why this numerator part is squared. Standard deviation squared is equal to variance. And the denominator of our equation is also basically equal to variance. Right, so, so basically we have variance divided by variance here, right? So assuming the data come from a normal distribution, the two things should be the same, right? So if our null hypothesis is true, the W statistic should be variance divided by variance essentially, and so it should equal one. Now, W values that are less than one indicate some difference from normality. But as with every statistical test, We'd expect some difference just because we have a, a random sample from a population, right? W is not be exactly one, right? It might be a little bit less than one. So the question is always like, well, how much less than one here can it be before we're too suspicious that this is not from a normal distribution, right? So that's what the p value is. It's the probability of finding a W statistic at least as small as the observed one if our null hypothesis is really true. And so Shapiro and Wilk actually got these p-values empirically rather than using a theoretical statistical distribution. But regardless, the smaller the W statistic gets, the more likely we are to conclude that our data differ significantly from a normal distribution. All right, so first a couple of cautions. Now, one thing to note is that the test can sometimes run into problems if your data contain a lot of sort of equal values. So there's, if there's a lot of like, tied values, a lot of sort of duplicates. Now, there are other tests of normality, which I'm not going to cover, but which you could check out if, you, if you're concerned about this. Also note that the test has little power to reject the null hypothesis if the sample size is small. On the other hand, if the sample size is large, it's likely to reject our null hypothesis even if the difference is very tiny from, from normality. Now, these are two typical problems of significance testing. This is, this is the sort of thing that you run into with lots of tests, especially for the sort of large sample size problem. So make sure to assess the real world, world importance of what you think, um, independent of just the statistical significance, right? It might be significant, but it might not be a meaningful significance if it's a, if it's a huge sample size, for example. Right. Also, be sure to remember that a large p-value only means that you're unable to reject the null hypothesis. It doesn't prove that it's a normal distribution. And I'll also note that you shouldn't use a Shapiro-Wilk test just to check the assumptions for a t-test or another. I said this at the beginning of the video as well. 
that this test is too sensitive for that purpose. Many data sets that might fail a Shapiro-Wilk test are perfectly fine for t-tests or for ANOVA. You should use histograms or QQ plots instead to look for, is there a lot of skew? If there is, then you might want to be concerned. All right, well, we'll end off by just summarizing how you might run a shapiro wilk test in R. And the function is about as simple as R functions can get here. It's just shapiro.test. You give it with a single numeric vector as the one input. So this will often be a single column in a data frame that contains numbers. There can be missing data, that's okay, but you can't have any non-numeric data in there. And the output is also pretty minimal. You just get the W statistic, well, the data that you used as well, and then the p-value. And you should report both of these values when summarizing your findings in writing. For example, you could write a sentence that looks like this, where you would say it either differs significantly or it doesn't differ significantly from a normal distribution. So that's all for now. Now, you don't often need to specifically test for normality, but if you do, the Shapiro-Wilk test is a good way to do it.